I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and here today with me is Maria Smirnova, Senior Portfolio Manager and Chief Investment Officer at Sprott Asset Management, which is a sub-advisor to Nine Point Partners. Before we get started, just a reminder that if you enjoy this interview, make sure you hit the like button and subscribe to our channel. Maria, thank you so much for joining me online today. Great to see you. Great to see you, Charlotte, as well, and thank you for having me on the program. Of course, and we have a lot to go through today, and we're going to start with gold. In previous interviews, you've helped us get an understanding of what's going on in gold by looking at three different factors, which are geopolitical tensions, monetary policy, and fiscal policy. I want to definitely go through all three of those today, but given the situation between Russia and Ukraine, I think geopolitical tensions is the place to start. So when the war first broke out, we saw a spike in the gold price. It's pulled back since then. What's your sense of if this is a short or long-term factor for the yellow metal? Well, certainly, we, you know, what is going on in Ukraine is, is, is devastating and, and tragic in my mind. Um, and we have been talking about the effect of the war and the global economy a lot. And it's not just gold. It is truly a world um, a world, you know, thing, it's going to have lasting, um, you know, I can't even speak about it, to be honest, but it will have a lasting effect on the world, I believe. In, in terms of gold itself, as you mentioned, um, you know, the reaction was a bit of safe haven flows into gold. Definitely, we saw that. But, but on a different scale, what we've been talking about is how the war is contributing to inflation. And I would point to three different areas it's contributing to inflation. And of course, that will have effect on economies around the world. And that is energy, and that is food and food security, and even metals, mining, you know, because Russia is a big supplier of certain metals, such as nickel, such as platinum, palladium, even gold and silver are going to be impacted. Um, so, you know, we could speak about all those areas, but I would say in short, not only does it have a short term effect, but I do think there will be long term implications as well. Yeah, I think you're, you're definitely right about that. And as you said, there are implications beyond gold. One of the things I know that you wrote about recently is how Russia is being prevented from accessing about 50% of its foreign reserves due to its actions against Ukraine. So I wondered if you could speak a little bit about that and also connect it to gold, if you could. Yeah, we think it's a very important um, thing that happened. So on February 24th, after Russia invaded Ukraine, um, in, on February 28th, so a few days later, uh, the US and Europe uh, prevented Russia or froze something like 300 um, billion of foreign exchange reserves that the Central Bank of Russia held outside the country um, as foreign reserves. Why is that so important? Well, imagine you know, your savings are frozen. You imagine you have a savings account, you've been saving money for a rainy day, that rainy day comes, but you can't access those savings. And uh, countries around the world, though, other countries are looking at what's happened and saying, well, if that can happen to us, um, we need to make sure that we can access our savings accounts, our foreign reserves. And we've already seen the trend of various central banks around the world buying gold as a, as a store of value. So, a couple of days after that announcement of the freezing of the foreign exchange, Central Bank of Russia announced a restarting of buying gold as well. Now, they hadn't been buying gold for a couple of years during COVID, and then they announced that they will restart buying. So that was an interesting, you know, immediate reaction by them announcing that. But again, we think that the broader implication of this is that other countries and other central banks around the world will follow suit and accelerate buying gold. Now, the data is delayed, so it's hard for us to say what's happening in real time, uh, but we will see as, as time goes on what's happening with that. Yeah, that'll certainly be a point to watch. 
Moving on from the geopolitical angle, we have a lot of eyes on what's going on with the Federal Reserve right now. So last month we had the 25 basis point hike and expectations are that we might have more this year and they may be higher than that. So I wanted to get your thoughts on what you see coming from the Fed in, in 2022. Yes, of course, there's been a lot of focus on the monetary policy of the Fed, definitely. Well, I think the market is expecting between seven and eight rate hikes this year. Uh, I think even there's some expectations of a 50 basis point hike in May as well. So an acceleration of that. Um, what will happen? Well, I guess there's different camps and I'm personally in the camp that I don't think the Fed can raise rates that much. Uh, there's a debate going on of how high is the neutral rate. The neutral rate is important because that's the, uh, you know, the level of, where the economy will, you know, where you can't raise rates anymore, essentially. Now, there's a lot of debate about that, like I said, but we're already seeing slowdown in the, in the economy, not just the US, the world economy, okay? But speaking to the US specifically, we are seeing slowdown in retail sales. We are seeing a drawdown of savings and increase in credit, credit use. Um, trucking activities rolled over. Housing activities weakening, uh, weakening in new mortgage applications, etc. There are signs in different areas of the economy that already things are slowing down. Why is that happening? Well, a uh, interest rates have risen already, even though a little bit, um, and also inflation. We've seen so much inflation, seven eight percent annualized, that the consumer is hurting from that, right? Uh, and like I said, a consumer has already been drawing down savings because. What we had in the last two years is a lot of um, stimulus in, in, in the form of handouts, in the form of checks, stimulus checks being written. Well, that's done now. And, and of course, while the stimulus was going on, we did see the increase in spending, housing activity, renovations, et cetera, you name it. Um, and so we are now transitioning slow down in, in, in durable goods and maybe a pickup in services and leisure. So restaurants, travel, all of that has picked up. So there has been that handoff, but overall I would say what we're seeing is a slowdown. Right, and so, you know, the Fed is taking these measures and others in an attempt to curb inflation, which you're right, we've seen so much of it over the last more than a year. What is your sense on what it will be able to accomplish there in terms of inflation after we've seen these high numbers recently? Well, that's a very, that's a difficult question to answer because there are different, um, different factors at play. On the one hand, yes, activity is slowing down. So you think inflation should slow down as well. But on the other hand, we are having these, um, you know, what I, what I explained about in the in in food and energy and because of the war um there's disturbances going on right so because of that that is increasing inflation energy is a big component um of inflation and and we are seeing inflation on that end so it's it's going to be a balance of several factors so i i'm i wouldn't make a call on exactly how much effect we will see yeah, that's that's very difficult. And, you know, as if all of this wasn't enough, we are starting to hear more concerns about whether we might be heading toward a recession. I've started to see lots of headlines about yield curve inversion. So I wondered if you could give me your thoughts on those topics. Well, again, it goes back to what I've, I've described, um, the slowdown, right? So yield inversion would imply that we might see a recession coming up. Now, there have been different studies. People are doing different analysis on whether there is a good correlation between the two. But the bottom line is um, the pickup in, in short-term interest rates is affecting uh, people's expectations about the future, people's ability to spend money, uh, and economic prospects, all of that. So you know, I, I'm fully in the camp that we will continue seeing a, very easily we could see a recession. Now, whether it's this year or next year, that's another debate. But I wouldn't be surprised if we saw another recession if the Fed continues on the path that they're continuing on. 
Yeah, it's another one we're going to have to keep a close eye on. So we've gone over geopolitical tensions, monetary policy. I want to touch briefly on fiscal policy, which we have discussed in the past. I haven't heard too much from that camp, but I wanted to ask you if there's anything that we might be missing there that investors should be aware of. Well, that's an excellent point you bring up because it's true. We haven't heard lately much about the stimulus plan that President Biden proposed during the election campaign. And actually, I, for one, was very much looking forward to that stimulus package because I think that would be great for, for the U.S. economy. Um, you know, it, it's interesting to me that when it came time to hand out checks, essentially helicopter money, we had no problem doing that. You know, Canada was guilty of it as well. But when it comes time to actually spend money on infrastructure, social programs, all of that, all of a sudden we don't have the money to do that. And that to me is very unfortunate because like I said, something like um, an infrastructure spend package would create not only jobs, but it would create a lasting effect on, on the economy in a positive way. So it's unfortunate to me that we haven't seen it. Now, in Europe, we are seeing, um, again, in Europe, they've, they've been going through an energy crisis because they're big, of their big reliance on oil and gas from Russia. Um, they have announced a program called Repower EU, and that is to help accelerate the transition to, well, first of all, reduce reliance on Russia, but also to, to accelerate transition to uh, greener energy. So I think that's positive. And in the long run, it will be positive for the world. And I just wish that we would see more and more of such initiatives. I know that in Canada, the budget just came out as well. We are talking about critical metals and materials and you know, putting more money into the ground and developing the industry. I think that to me is positive as well. So things like that, I, I like to see because that's actually good for the longer term. Okay, and if we put everything all together that we've been talking about, what do you think we'll see from the gold price this year? Well, the gold price has been, you know, actually doing quite well. We're, you know, around 1950 right now. I think that's positive. Um, I think the market, though, is waiting to see again what happens with monetary policy, with interest rates specifically, uh, with, you know, the runoff of the balance sheet as central banks have accumulated record balance sheets, um, you know, that all means money printing, really fiat money printing. And, and to us, gold is, is a currency. Gold is a store of value. And it has been acting well, like I said. Now, critics of gold will say, well, it's, it's not $2,000 or it's not gone beyond that. But to me, you know, it, it's on the right path and it's demonstrating that while the general market is selling off, gold has been doing well and is demonstrating exactly that quality of diversification uh, of portfolios. So to me, that, that's positive. Um, and, and hopefully that, you know, when that gold price starts flowing through and it has already been flowing through to the miners, the equities respond to. They've started to respond, but in a minor way. Um, we, we need to see, you know, I guess more earnings, more cash flow generation, which again, we've, always, we've said for a while that mining companies have been doing a better job of managing their balance sheets and their operations. And we just need to see more of that going forward. Okay, and I wanna take a quick look at silver as well. We know that it follows many of the same drivers that gold has, but it has its, its own unique drivers as well. So I wondered if you could talk about what investors should pay attention to there and also go into silver price expectations for 2022. Right. So silver is actually one area where I wish it would be doing better. And I think people still don't realize how, um, how important silver is in the greener economy and what we've talked about, you know, about transitioning away from uh, fossil fuels and to, to the future. Um, silver plays a big role in solar and projections for silver use in solar continue to grow. Uh, it's used in automotive, in electric vehicle, it, and it, in greater amounts in electric vehicles versus internal combustion engine vehicles. So the list goes on. Silver is very important in that area. Um, but it has this dual, dual head, right? It's an investment vehicle, but it's also used in industry. 
So I think it's a bit in limbo right now, right? It doesn't know which way to turn, but I think once gold picks up steam more, and we see this every single time, we saw this in COVID, we saw this in GFC, et cetera. Uh, once gold kind of picks up steam, silver outperforms. And, and so we're not quite there yet, but you know, it will come. I'm quite, uh, I'm quite confident of that. And I will also point out um, that there have been quite aggressive expectations of mine supply growth, which have been, they're being revised down right now because unfortunately on the silver side, well, it's not as easy to bring production back. And especially we're still coming out of COVID, we're still having um, in certain countries, COVID outbreaks, uh, not everywhere, but in, in certain areas. And that is unfortunately still affecting miners. Uh, so I would say that on the supply side, it hasn't bounced back as fast as people thought it would. So that is positive for the silver price, of course. Um, so I think, you know, on the demand side, the demand is very healthy and strong because investment is coming back as well. And then on the supply side, it's steady, but I think people may be disappointed by how fast silver mining will come back. Right. And you started to talk a little bit about the companies. So maybe the most important question for investors right now, where do you see the most opportunity when it comes to the gold and silver stocks at the moment? Well, um, recently larger caps have been doing better, but we, we do believe that for us, the, the best opportunities still lie in exploration and small to mid-sized production. Uh, why is that? Well, the, the large miners, the big caps, are struggling to maintain output and grow output. Whereas, you know, this is where the juniors come in, number one, by finding ounces. And that's why we love explorers, people who raise money to put, you know, to drill and put money in the ground. And on the production side, we've seen some consolidation in the industry. And it's, you know, generally happened in the smaller end of things. Um, so, it, you know, for us, again, that's our sweet spot. We do focus on the small to mid caps. Uh, I will say that one area that's becoming more tr tricky for us is development. And that is because we are seeing inflation. There is inflation in mining as well, not just in our everyday lives. And you know, to build a project is getting harder and harder because we are seeing CapEx increases. Um, so we're being very, very careful in that specific area. Right, that makes definitely a lot of sense. You know, when it comes to the gold and silver stocks, one thing that I hear all the time is for them to really take off. We need to get that mainstream investor interest back in the market. So I wanted to check in with you on that. Do you think that's something that we are headed toward and, and when might that come? <laughs> well, that's the million dollar question, isn't it? Um, like I said, I think we are seeing signs of that at least in the physical market. But I guess in order for, for investors to come in big time to the equities, that's step number two, right? Um, people want to believe that the gold and silver price is sustainable, right? And again, it, it we see it every time as well. It happened last time in COVID. It, it comes as the next stage. So if we have a bit of more rally in gold and silver, investors will pile into the equities as well. And I think what's helping right now is what I mentioned before, is the general market has been seeing weakness. Um, so, you know, maybe people should consider owning some mining equities, gold and silver equities as a, as a hedge or diversifier for that. Yeah, so thanks for taking on the tricky questions. The last thing for you today is if there's any other final thoughts you would add for investors on, on gold and silver right now that you think we should know about. Well, I think we, we've covered a lot of ground. Um, to be honest, our thesis has not changed in years. Again, we believe in gold and silver and the associated miners as, as a diversifier of portfolios um, because what we have seen in the world in the last at least 20 years is, is expansion of debt, um, growing deficits, governments overspending, and a real lack of you know, by governments of um, trying kind of to fix the issues in a fundamental way, 
Whereas it's like I said before, it's just easier for them to print some more money to fix the issue shorter term. And so from that perspective, gold and silver will continue going up. Um, they are hard assets, they are real assets. And, and to us, they're pretty much currency as well. Okay, perfect. This was very informative. Thanks for taking the time to talk. It was great to speak with you. Thank you very much. Great. And once again, I'm Charlotte McLeod with the Investing News Network, and this is Maria Spernova with Sprott Asset Management.